in death before uh rapture in death by jd robb um so i read it very quickly because if you've been following my videos you know that these are super easy reads for me um they all are very um they follow very systematic comfortable plot beats character beats etc um i i'm done I think I'm done. Um, it's hard to, it's very hard to get past this first hurdle of it being written when it was in the 90s, the mid to late 90s. And so much of that is coming through in the writing and the character work. And I just don't understand. I guess I just don't have enough of a breadth of understanding of what the, um, the women's suspense thriller fiction publishing was like when Nora was writing this series. Um, uh, Eve Dallas is a very hard character to like. Rourke is a very hard character to like. Um, <laughs> as in book three there's a scene where um, Rourke says something that Eve doesn't like and Eve punches him in the gut and it was supposed to be like oh Rourke really likes it. And he really likes how aggressive she is that way. Um, it happens again in this book. And I'm just like, what are we doing here with this character? Why is Eve so aggressively entrenched in aggressive male um, characteristics? She, like, literally everything about Eve is basically a 90s action male action star and like okay if that's what Nora wanted to write okay fine I can see that influence but it doesn't make for very compelling character work when you are book four in a series that is going to continue um uh, Eve doesn't like hospitals and doesn't like medication so she doesn't take any meds she just toughs it out because she's so tough and like Oh, and then laughably in every single book, she'll just be like bopping along to go to the next scene, except a crime happens and she has to jump into the fray, literally in some aspects. And every single time, just some random crime happens while she happens to be in the vicinity and she literally jumps into a fight. Um, and then we have a whole scene reiterating, reiterating how much she doesn't like medication and going to the hospital and taking meds blah 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 so yeah and then um in this book especially i didn't like how the eve's aversion to medication and drugs it kind of veered uncomfortably into um how to say this like like saying drugs even to help with mental health issues like it felt almost like it was veering in that direction because of a stimulant that Eve's ta Eve takes to help her be more alert um just the way it's described um felt a little icky um and just I just it's 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 icky uh, um I I don't know how to say it other than sounding like a five-year-old it's icky and I'm not having a good time anymore. Um, it's super easy to read. And that's literally the only positive at this point. The murder mysteries have all been kind of terrible. The actual mysteries have all been absolutely kind of terrible. And this one was especially bad because you, you I, I figured out who the actual murderer was about halfway through the book. And maybe even had an inkling like, when this character first shows up like in the first like 20 percent of the book um <sighs> i wish i had better things to say about this but i really don't um it, uh, so much of it like mavis everything about mavis the way she's described the character that she is like i don't understand um Peabody, the way um, Eve's new aide, Peabody, is a woman, um, uh, 
police officer who wants to become a detective so um, Eve takes her under her wing and the way Peabody is described as like a literal like every time there's a hot dude she like goes out of her mind with lust and then has to be like <laughs> I don't know so much was going on in the 90s um anyways I I um yeah I'm done uh, four books I think four books was enough and I know this goes up to almost 60 books and I'm sure there has to be a point where things take a turn for the better or at least there is a gradual improvement in the series and especially a lot of the gender politics and stuff like that but um, I'm not gonna sit through all of that unfortunately no so I'm glad I finally tried the series out I understand how it's so readable and why it's so well loved to a point and why it lasted the test of time over time maybe if i had been reading this if i had been a too young 15 year old finding this series in like the early 2000s i would have i would be a absolute fan like i can see 15 year old me finding this in like the year 2000 and like gobbling it all up so um, yeah, so here ends my journey with the In Death series. Um, whoop de doo <laughs> Quick update, I ended up finishing The Butcher of the Forest by Premi Muhammad today. Um, this was fine. Um, I, I don't know if I am surprised that I did enjoy it as much as I thought I would, because as I was reading it, I realized that, oh, this is absolutely dark gothic fairy tale vibes and for me gothic as a uh, genre descriptor does not work um I don't know it just has never worked for me I don't think it ever will or if it does it's a very very rare occasion that it does um so I have enjoyed a previous work by Premi Mohammed um I think it was called and what can we offer you tonight um, and I read the first bit of this in the store before I bought it and was intrigued. But as it went on, um, I don't know that any of it really stuck with me. So essentially, this story is a story of this small village that sits next to a forest that is enchanted. So like you can always go on the north side of the forest, but the south side is um, mysterious and dark. And anybody who goes in there never comes out, except for this one woman named Varys who went in and brought a child back out of the forest once a long time ago. And we start the story with Varys being dragged in front of the the tyrant of the area who took over um, her lands. And he forces her to go into the forest after his two children who went into the forest. And she has to bring them back within a certain time amount of time or he's going to kill her family and her entire village. So that is the essential plot. Um, this, as Ferris goes into the forest and starts to, you know, try to figure things out, she starts to meet and run into a lot of like really weird, creepy creatures, creepy crawlies, lots of weird stuff going on. And that is where the fairy tale feeling of this really comes in. Like this really is a dark fairy tale. And if that is something that is your vibe, absolutely check this out um that's <laughs> the vibes are vibing in this one um Varys finds the children and they have to make their way back out that I don't think that's much of a spoiler essentially because what is really happening here is the lush writing the descriptor the description of everything going on the fairy tale the dark gothic feel of this that is where the strength of this book is. And unfortunately for me, that is not a strength that appeals to me personally as a reader. So while I really did enjoy Premi Muhammad's writing, um, this just didn't hit the spot for me. So I think I ended up giving it 3.5 stars because very strong writing, very strong vibes. For someone whose the vibes are gonna work for this, it's really gonna work. So um, I would still recommend this to anybody who loves the idea of dark fairy tales where you want more of a vibe than a really strong plot or character. Like we do have a strong character in Varys, like no doubt, but that's not where the actual um, meat of the theming is, I think. Um, but it was great for what it was doing. 
it was great for the writing but not great for me personally so um that was the butcher of the forest by premium muhammad i am going to read more by her i think she had something come out this year also called the siege of burning grass and i feel like she has more coming out like she's very prolific at the moment so um definitely check out and what can we offer you tonight i really enjoyed that novella from a year uh, two years ago i think that was really also vibing but also had a little bit more meat to it that i really enjoyed so um this didn't work for me but premi muhammad is an author i'm going to continue to try out and hope that um uh, more of what i try out from her in the future will work for me another really quick update um red loved yona of the dawn volume 41 um I can't really talk about this in depth because it is volume 41 of a manga series so pretty much most of the plot and stuff that happens this volume is a spoiler but um essentially if you don't know the story this is a manga about a princess named Yona who is very spoiled and pampered until the day that her father is murdered and um someone else takes over as king of her country and she has to go into hiding go on the run with um her loyal best friend and guard Hawk and um along the way she gathers um this band of friends who are all like mystical drag have mystical dragon powers etc etc so it's a um fantasy that you know getting the magical band together found family found friends and eventually it becomes this really really in-depth really fantastic political fantasy along the way also so um volume 41 we continue in this storyline and i want to say more but i can't i just can't um there's a lot of action in this volume we'll put it that way and even though we know everybody's going to be okay because that's how it is and that's how it should be i will not bear the very thought of any of the dragons getting killed no um it's still exciting and we actually learn something new about um the origin of the dragons which is kind of cool and interesting and i want to kind of see some expansion on that so i um, loved it love the color this is my girl yona let me see if i can get some of this art i do have to say one thing about this volume in particular is that the art um something about the way hawk is being drawn is a little weird like his neck is always like super thick and like his chin is always really recessed like here like that like like it's really weird how he's being drawn in this volume um but still say oh yeah here this was particularly egregious like his neck is the size of like an, a formula one driver or something like what is that but um it gets fixed later on like there are no major issues let me see i'm trying to find oh my babies there's hawk and yona in fighting stance i'm trying to cover up any spoilers there's my babies um but yeah that's volume 41 um please try it out <laughs> i know rambling about the 41st volume in an ongoing manga series probably isn't the most um helpful thing to get anybody to check something out but definitely check this out it's literally my favorite manga series ever 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 and um i am sad that i'm all caught up because now this literally uh, technically comes out tomorrow because it was out early on the shelves at my store so now i have to wait forever for the next volume so i'm sad but also happy that I finally got the next volume so that was yona um that was quite a bit that I read today and we'll see how the rest of the week takes me. Really quick update because I got some uh, review copy books in from Neon Hemlock Press. So um, they had some available and they so very kindly sent me three books for review and I'm very excited about this. So the first is Finding Echoes, A Tale of New Arcadia by Foz Meadows. Foz Meadows um, released a Strange and Stubborn Endurance last year or the year before. Um, I haven't read that. I haven't read anything from Falls Meadows yet, but I'm super interested. I'm hoping this um, novella will be a really good intro to their work. This is 
uh, a quote, show me a city of walls and I'll show you a city of tunnels. Snow Kidama speaks to ghosts among the local gangs of Charybdis precinct, isolated from the rest of New Arcadia by the city's ancient walls. But when his old lover, Jem, a man he thought dead, shows up in need of his services, Snow is forced to reevaluate everything. Snow and Jem must navigate not only their feelings for each other, but a political plot bigger than both of them and a drug-ridden city on the edge of collapse. So that is Finding Echoes. I try to get the this ring light situation is a little annoying, but gotta do what you gotta do, and it matches. Okay, next is Off Time Jive by A Z Louise. So get a load of that cover. It's actually pretty cool. The more I look at it, the more weird it seems, and the more I like it. So Off Time Jive. This says Bessie Knox is an investigator of magical mysteries. In an alternate Harlem Renaissance where new forms of magic created by black joy strained against the white establishment, Knox's old colleagues at the Bronx Academy of Magic have started turning up dead, pushing her weakened abilities to their limits. And now, if she can't solve the case, she might be next. So that sounds so cool to me. Alternate Harlem Renaissance with magic created by black joy. Let's go. Let's do it. So this one's a little shorter, but um, I'm actually super excited about this one. And then lastly, we have The Dragonfly Gambit by A.D. Sui. And this, um, all empires fall, it's only natural. Nearly 10 years after Inez Cato sustained a career-ending injury during a military exercise gone awry, she lies, cheats, and seduces her way to the very top to destroy the fleet that she was once a part of, even at the cost of her own life. Ennis Razal, third daughter of the rule, has six months left to live. She is desperate to end the 20-year war she was birthed to fight. But when she brings Inez aboard the mothership, a chess game of manipulation and double-crossing begins to unfold, and the rule doesn't stand a chance. So that is The Dragonfly Gambit by E.D. Sui. This one's a little longer, about 120-ish pages. So super excited. I'm so, so happy that Neon Hemlock has sent these to me. And... Um, I don't know, I feel like now that I have quite a few novellas from Neon Hemlock, I feel like maybe I'm going to do just a full video that is only reviewing um, Neon Hemlock titles. Um, so that's actually a project that I'm actually getting kind of excited about. Um, there are lots of a bunch of speculative novellas that all sound very interesting and I'm super excited. So yeah, so thank you again, Neon Hemlock. Um, just, I'm so excited to get into these. So woohoo, book haul. Late night, ring light eyes. <laughs> um, I'm gonna take them off while I talk. Um, if I squint a bit, it's just cause that's how my eyesight is. Um, okay. What was I gonna talk about? It's late, it's like midnight. Um, I just spent the last two hours scrolling TikTok when I intended to do this like two hours ago. What am I gonna talk about? I guess first things first, I will talk about my book haul. Um, I've been very excited to pick up this book this week because it's beautiful. And yeah, I've fallen for that. It's beautiful. Yeah. That book is... Oh, it's okay. It's okay. Five Broken Blades by My Corland. Um, no, okay. I'm putting my glasses back on for this and I got to actually look at stuff. Um, so, you know, just fine you know, sort of generic fantasy-ish. It gives fantasy. It's giving, you know, some kind of assassin, maybe. Da -da -da -da. Um, yeah. Yeah, I am basic. I fell for it. Beautiful sprayed edges. Um, if you can kind of see there, the figure and the trees, the sun, the red, the clouds, the birds, um, it's beautiful. And then on the back, um, and funny story about this is um, I can't even feel bad about buying it because I saw it at Target and it had a 30% off sticker. And for once that Target sticker came off with no issue, praise. Um, so 30% off, uh, this book retails for $32, $33, 30 off. And when I went to the register, I saw it ring up <laughs> with the 30% off price. And then the cashier like manually entered the discount. Like they saw the sticker, manually entered the discount. And um, 
I got this for 60% off. So I do not feel bad about that <laughs> whatsoever. Um, they make these books beautiful so that people like me gets little dopamine hits from buying the very pretty books. So I'm not going to feel bad for accidentally getting it for 60% off. Okay. Don't nobody hit with that. But anyways, um, the inside of the book, the end papers. No, they don't. There's the beautiful embossed cover. It's gorgeous. Ooh, the five moons, maybe like the five blades. There's that side. And then the end papers. I didn't know, I didn't know about the end papers. So that's beautiful. Let the best liar win. And the back is the same, it's just reversed. So um, I am so excited about this. And essentially the story is about five, well, five liars, um, five criminals in some fashion or another who get the chance to try to execute this tyrant king of their land, I think. Um, yeah, the king of Yusan must die. And these five people sort of come together to do this action, try to get the king, but only one of them uh, has will be able to um, actually kill him. And it's like they agree that the king must die, but they don't agree on how and like butting heads. So I'm kind of excited to see how it goes. I know this is from Entangled Publishing, who maybe don't have the best track record. Um, but and like uh, no, no, no shade to anybody who likes the books that come out from Entangled. I just generally they're not my thing. But this sounds interesting. And I'm not saying that just because it's a pretty book and I'm trying to justify buying a pretty book. Um, it sounds interesting. I was interested in it before I even knew that there was going to be a special, like a special sprayed edges edition. So um, I'm actually probably going to start reading this pretty soon. Um, I'm kind of slumpy at the moment. And part of that is because I, I have this Nebula and Hugo reading project and I know myself and I know that the Nebula and Hugo books are typically books that I am excited about no matter what. Um, they're books that I have been aware of over the last year and maybe for one reason or another I just didn't pick them up. And making myself read books for a specific reason doesn't work out for me. So um, I read Starter Villain out of this project out of the books I haven't yet read and then I just didn't pick another book up. <laughs> um, well, I did, but we'll talk about that. That was The Crane Husband by Kelly Bornhill. And I ended up DNFing this one. Now, this is not because that the, this is bad. It's actually incredibly well written, and I can see why it got so much acclaim and so many positive reviews on Goodreads. I DNF this because I need to be good to myself, and sometimes when a topic and in this case domestic abuse um a mother um having domestic uh, uh, a mother being in a toxic domestic abuse uh, domestic abuse relationship while her children are watching and the older sister is trying to protect the younger brother from all of it um um, some things I don't do, some things I can't do, and I gave it a try. I knew that I knew that was the story when I was going in. Um, I gave it a try. I think I got about 40, 45 pages in, and I decided to be kind to myself and not continue. Um, Kelly Barnhill's writing is very good. This is not the type of story I would um, migrate towards in the first... Like, I knew this came out. I was aware of it when it came out, and I just... It, it just didn't sound like anything I wanted to read. I picked it up because of the Nebula slash Hugos. And um, despite it being the type of story that I don't gravitate towards, like Kelly Barnhill's writing is very good. I was very immersed in what was going on, the story and this family, the relationships, the toxicity that she had set up. And um, I'll give it credit for that. Very much credit for that. Um, but... Yeah, um, I had to DNF it. So that is all of the progress I've made in 
reading Hugo, uh, Hugo and Nebula um, shortlist items. I'm thinking about, that was a novella from the novella list. Um, I don't know about the novels. I do own Witch King and Terraformers and I'm very motivated to read my physical TBR, but I don't know about my library books. I'm probably just gonna take them back. So, and then just, um, if I still feel like doing it later this year, I'll check them back out. So kind of pausing on that whole project. Okay, Crane Husband, DNF. Uh, I finished The Warrior's Apprentice by Lois McMaster Bujold. This is a uh, entry in the Vorkosican saga. I've been slowly reading this and I think last week's video, um, I did a small book haul where I found three um, mass market paperbacks of the saga. Warrior's Apprentice is not one I own. Um, I am on the lookout for it. So I did this on audio. The audio is fantastic. Um, I actually started reading this ages ago and then I paused because this this is the first book in the saga that I have read that is Miles. I actually started reading it. The first book I read was Shards of Honor which is um, Cordelia and Errol Vorkosigan who are Miles' parents. Um, the the majority of the Vorkosigan saga is about Miles Vorkosigan but I started with Shards of Honor and then I went on to Baryar which are the two books about his parents. So I love his parents. I love Cordelia. She's like one of my all-time favorite um, female sci-fi characters at this point. And so it was a little bit jarring to move on to Miles and to move on to this book where it kind of uses a trope that I'm not a huge fan of where a character sort of fumbles their way accidentally into a situation and then has to keep moving forward, forward momentum, as Miles says in the book. That is not a trope that I enjoy. That is not a story, like a storyline that I enjoy. Um, at least not in the way that Miles was moving forward in this, in the beginning of this. I was about 54% when I paused on the audio months ago, and then I finally just got it um re got it back from my library thankfully libby still had my place and it continued and things evolved in terms of miles um sort of um fumbling his way through and this sort of like pretending who you to be who you aren't and people believe in you that is a trope that i'm not a fan of because it's the sort of like imposter syndrome-ish thing that makes me very uncomfortable personally on a personal level but in the last half of the book that kind of evened out miles um fell more into it and then there was a lot more other plot like smaller plot stuff that started to feed into the greater plot and that helped a lot um there's the death of a character that i was actually really shocked happened and i was a little verklempt um and then the ending that brings in a lot more like political stuff like that directly affects Miles and um, his parents or rather his father. That was fun. I was I was super excited when that started trickling in in like the 70-80% mark. I was like yes oh my gosh yes 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 let's get back to that. So when we got back to that when we got away from this first story where Miles essentially somehow ends up creating a mercenary fleet of like 3,000 people and ships and everything um the way he like stumbles into that um that was not my favorite but the little bits of the other stuff the political stuff the family stuff the relationship stuff that is the stuff that I love in this saga the Bujold right so I was super excited for those parts I was super excited for Miles and his feelings for Elena I was super excited for um everything that happened with Balthari I was excited for when um this character shows up in about the 70% mark and kicks off all the political stuff. Like I was excited. That's the meat of the stuff that I like in this series. So I'm um, moving on to the next one. I'm not sure what the next one is. I think it's the Vor game. I'm, I'm reading in kind of chronological order. Um, according to um, Bujold's website, I think she has a page where she has like a, a suggested reading order. So I think the Vor game is next. So, um, and that I actually own in paperback. It's up here somewhere out of, out of frame. Um, so yeah, Warrior's Apprentice, I gave that 3.5 or 4 stars. Um, what was next? Oh, The Brides of High Hill by Nevo, which is book uh, novella number five in the Singing Hill cycle. Um, I love this series. I love Nevo. She is pretty much at this point 
an auto read author, if not an auto buy author. Um, I haven't bought the Singing Hill Cycle at all, so I didn't buy this one. I managed to be first in line for the audiobook at my library, so I got it the day it came out. I, I read it in one day, essentially. Commute to work and commute back. And even at 1.5, 1.75 speed, if that sounds like a lot of driving to you, yeah, it's a lot of driving. Um, it was great. It was a great entry into the series. Um, if you don't know about the series, it is the series about, it's sort of a fantasy that is set in a world that feels like China, East Asia, but maybe isn't. Like, it's never really specifically stated, but it is East Asian influenced. And we follow um, a cleric named Chi, and they have they are part of the Singing Hills Abbey, which is an abbey that is all about monks who go around, or clerics who go around, and um, taken stories from all over the world and they remember these stories and cleric's companion is a bird named almost brilliant and they're a type of bird that have photographic memories and they also keep stories and singing hills records all of these stories so cleric chi wanders around gets into shenanigans in each book and each book is a little different and in this one um chi is um, accompanying a young bride on her way to be married to an older man and things are afoot on the estate that the old man lives on and one of the things about Nevo is that I love her writing a lot and her writing works for me so well to the point where that this I would say this entry this novella actually falls under really um weird gothic feelings in terms of like the creepy mansion the weird like the weirdness going on it does have gothic vibes and gothic is an anti-buzzword for me I just don't do well gothic and I don't mesh well so it's a testament to how much I avoid Nevo's writing that that did not bother me at all I was into it um it doesn't make this a favorite of mine I think I would slot this probably third or fourth favorite out of the five which you know three or four out of five is not like glowing but when he has something as great as the last one which was mammoths at the gate and i love into the riverlands a lot which i don't think is a very popular opinion but those are my top two um three four like third or fourth place it's a every single entry is really great so um i liked this loved chi and one of the greater strengths that nevo has in this series is that we have the steady presence of Chi as our main character that we always, so we always have an anchor point in a book. And then Nevo creates a whole new scenario around Chi. So we're learning new characters, we're learning new customs and traditions and uh, around this world. So we have a whole new scenario we have to get to learn, new characters we're getting to learn and understand, but we're doing it with Chi as our anchor point. And that works so well for me. You get something fresh and interesting and new in every iteration of this series, but we always have Chi and Almost Brilliant there to anchor us and, you know, accompany us and keep us, you know, company. So um, I love the series a lot. Um, I'm not going to say much more about this entry because um, they're novellas. They're very short. Don't want to spoil it too much for you, um, but I highly recommend the series. You can read any of the books out of order, but why would you? Read them Read them in order. They're great. Um, so yeah, Brides of High Hill, that was a 4, 4.5-ish. And the audiobook is great. Um, let's see. That is all that I've finished since last week. Um, what am I currently reading? Um, like I said, I'm kind of in a bit of a reading mood, reading slump. Um, I haven't picked up anything physical since I DNF'd Crane Husband. Um, obviously I finished Warrior's Apprentice on audio, The Brides of High Hill on audio, so I'm a bit of a physical reading slump. Um, so the what I'm reading is on my Kindle, it is my read before I go to sleep book, and that is Remnant Population by Elizabeth Bear. Or is it Elizabeth Moon? I think it's Elizabeth Moon. Bear Moon. There's, I, I know there are two authors with those names. This, oh my god. Okay, I'm gonna put it here to be sure which one it is. Um, the cover, you'll see her name. Um, like I said, it's like 1220 already, so, you know. Mm. Um, so this is a, um, older sci-fi where, a story where there is this colony that has, uh, been set up on this planet and at the start of the story we follow this older woman 
named Ophelia, who has been on this colony for about 40 years. She was transported over um, when she was younger. All her children except for one have passed away. She just has her son and his wife. And the book starts with the corporation that governs the colony, owns the colony, telling them that they're giving up on the colony and moving the colonists out. They have no choice in this. 30 days and they're all gone. And Ophelia is like, I'm not going. Ophelia decides not to go. And there's something lovely in the way she is finding freedom in this, even though she does find a way to avoid um, leaving with everybody else. The freedom that she finds in the little things and the freedom that she's exploring, she ex she's exploring being with herself and being um, kind of true to who she wants to be and figuring out who that is, is pretty lovely. I'm still maybe like 20% into the book. So um, the rest of the story apparently, I guess, is that there is like a, a native um, alien population on this planet. And um, I think another attempt at colonization is made at a different site, but then the native aliens kill all those people. And I think according to the synopsis is that eventually Ophelia makes contact with these aliens and then they have to deal with people coming back to avenge the colonists that were all slaughtered. So um, I don't know, I haven't reached her connecting with the um, native um, population yet, but um, so far I'm enjoying it. It's not what I expected. I, I don't know. I think I expected a lot more like hardcore sci-fi stuff, but it, it really is just like mainly been a character study about Ophelia um like I said exploring her freedom exploring herself and what it means to be her which has been pretty lovely um so yeah uh reading Remnant Population getting through that um bit by bit on my Kindle um right before I go to bed so that is it that's all I've got to talk about um I have no idea what my TBR is going to be I have no idea what I want to pick up if I'm even going to physically pick up anything in the next few days we'll see how it goes um, but yeah, hopefully, um, this wasn't too rambly, didn't stare off into space too much, or at least I edited it out. Um, hopefully I've edited this enough so that I don't seem absolutely bonkers for filming something at midnight. Um, so, uh, thanks for watching and I will catch you next week.